Well, good morning. This is the annotation video for the poem Envy by Mary Lamb. And um, this is taken, this is the second poem taken from the Towards a World Unknown OCR Poetry Anthology. And we're working with the conflict section uh, in this video. So this uh, anthology is arranged in age order, meaning the oldest poems are towards the start and then the more me recent modern poems are towards the end. Uh, this is the second one, still very much in the same time period to Blake. Um, let's get into the poem. It's not, it's not very long, um, so the video isn't going to be very long today. Uh, we're going to have a quick think about her, Mary Lamb, as a poet, the person that she was first before we start reading the poem itself. So what can we say about this lady? Well, the first thing that I would say is that she struggled with mental illness all her life. She had a history, documented history of mental illness, and her brother had to be her carer. She was institutionalised um, and spent some time here, sort of being sectioned in hospitals. Um, but in between those periods, when she was perhaps feeling um, a bit more focused, um, she would write poems and she would write also nursery rhymes and fairy tales as well for young children. So these are the first two things I think are, are important biographical information for this poem. She also uses um, abstract nouns in her poems. Um, so as this one is called envy, that's what I mean by uh, abstract nouns, I mean um, things that can't be held, they're not actual things but they are, they sort of relate to feelings, they relate to, and this one relates to the, the sin of envy. That's going to come in handy, that's going to be important later. So she would use abstract nouns and she would try to um, explore these abstract nouns using metaphors. Uh, and, and in this poem, the metaphor that she uses is a rose tree, a rose bush, um, talking about how sweet the rose petals are, how sweet the flowers are, and how a rose tree would be foolish to want to be anything but a rose tree. And this is the metaphor that she uses to explore this abstract noun of envy. And she did that quite a lot in her poems. And it was probably so that it would be easier for children to understand. Okay, this is good because there's not much in this poem that we need to go through and define. It's a very simple, straightforward poem. There's not much to be said about this poem, um, but we'll try to find um, some details to help you in terms of the language and structure choices that the poet has made. So let's get into the uh, poem and uh, if you've got your anthology with you I'd encourage you to go through. I'm going to be using uh, yellow pen for structure, pink pen for language and we'll have a quick look at the message as well. But let's read it together. Envy. This rose tree is not made to bear the violet blue nor lily fair nor the sweet mignonette and if this tree were discontent, or wished to change its natural bent, it all in vain would fret. And should it fret, you would suppose, it ne'er had seen its own red rose, nor after gentle shower had ever smelled its rose's scent, or it could ne'er be discontent with its own pretty flower. Like such a blind and senseless tree, as I have imagined this to be, all envious persons are, with care and culture all may find some pretty flower in their own mind, some talent that is rare. See, that's the whole poem, three stanzas long and they're all of equal length. What's important to note first is the story of the poem. So the story of the poem is what is going on in a very simple, on a very simple level. And this may seem overly, overly simple today, but we're going to try and keep things simple. So on a very, very basic level, what is this poem all about? Well, Mary Lamb is saying, don't envy. If you have your own talents, <clears throat> you should appreciate them. So talents are to be appreciated, whatever those talents are. And envy is um, pointless anyway. 
because you can't be something that you're not. Um, and I think she uses the metaphor of a rose bush, and we'll talk about that um, those choices in a second, just to kind of emphasize basically how pointless it is to to envy people. Okay, so this is the this is the story of the poem. I'm just going to highlight it at the top here for my notes later, so I can keep it clear. Um, and that, that's basically it really, there's nothing more to say in terms of the story of the poem, but the structure has been arranged, I think quite cleverly, to build quite a logical argument. If we think about her messages in this poem, it's slightly different to what the story is. It's like her attitudes as a poet towards these things, towards these themes, the theme of envy, the theme of conflict. So the... Um, the message that she has in this poem seems to be uh, to say self-doubt and envy are unavoidable. Okay, she's not criticizing people and condemning people who experience self-doubt and envy of other people. She's saying it's quite natural, it's unavoidable. There's also this idea of self-conflict. We think about this poetry anthology as being all about conflict. Well this poem is one about self-conflict and I think she's saying that it's a natural part of the human experience to think negatively of yourself, to have some kind of conflict within yourself about your identity. But it should be, as we've said at the top, should be avoided as it is vain, it's pointless, there's no point in trying to be something that you're not. So these seem to be her key messages here and I think it's helpful for us to think about the conflict that's in the poem. The conflict is between sort of image and reality. The person that you want to be versus the person that you actually are. Jekyll could understand something about this, I think. Um, but it's also maybe the conflict is between people as well. You know, different types of people. I think that there's more in this poem about self-conflict. So we're thinking specifically about self-conflict in this poem today, okay? So these are her messages um, that she's bringing to us um, about this poem. What's the tone like in this poem as well? Well, the tone, and I'm going to flesh out this as we go through, but I always like to keep my notes quite organised um, in terms of the, the layout on the page because they can get quite messy, annotations can. I think this tone... Again, we were thinking about Blake trying to teach us something. There's a word for that in English, and it's called didactic, um, when we learn something from the poem. So I think there is a didactic tone in this poem, and we'll get into that in a second. I think that there is um, instructions. It's quite an instructional tone. It seems to be, I don't think it's patronising, but it seems to be telling us um, certain consequences and the, the right way to be. And there's also quite a logical tone, I think, to this as well. And each of these things we're going to have a look at because we can't make a point about this poem being instructional, logical or didactic without having the evidence to back that up. And that usually comes in the form of techniques that the writer is using to achieve those effects. Okay, so let's go back up to the top of the poem and start looking at the first stanza. This rose tree is not made to bear the violet blue nor lily fair, nor the sweet mignonette. So the first word that we need to define is this word mignonette, which just means a sweet smelling grass-like plant. I had to look that up because I had no idea. I'm not very green fingered. Um, but this is what it means. So she's saying if you're a rose tree, you shouldn't expect to grow blue flowers or lilies, or you shouldn't expect to smell like something that you're not. And if this tree were discontent or wish to change its natural bent, this word just meaning that the natural way um, it grows. 
doesn't mean anything about being bent out of shape it kind of just means that the natural way that it's kind of destined to be it's all in vain would fret and it's interesting to me to explore a little bit of the structure here so structural choices happening in this first stanza would be things like if you get your structural color out end stop lines and actually if you look down the whole poem it's an end it's every stanza is end stopped as well every stanza seems to be sorry I'll smooth that over every every stanza seems to be contained in itself okay so end stop lines stanzas they are complete contained arguments in each stanza we're going to have a little think about that in a second what else can we say about this well we can see quite a conflict already emerging in terms of the words that are using because we've got this word uh lily fair sweet mignonette uh, the violet blue, the rose tree, all of these kind of positive, we're getting this semantic field of nature and not just nature, I idyllic nature. It seems to be quite an idyllic picture but that is contrasted with the not, nor, nor, discontent, change, bent, vain, Okay, so we've got this kind of constant conflict in the poem, even in that first stanza. Okay, so we've got lots of negative, emotive language here. I'm so sorry, probably just gave you a shock. Um, so we've got the semantic field of the nature, we've got the emotive language of the negative coming in as well and I think that's really central to the conflict in this poem. What else can we say about this poem? Well I've noticed that there's a that there's the, the initial metaphor that's set up um, in terms of nature, in terms of the rose tree. She's personifying a rose tree. Why would she do that? There must be a reason. So this is a, obviously a language choice again. The rose tree is personified in order to create an effect. Well, that effect could be that it's point, it's, it's, it just kind of emphasizes, just as rose trees can't change their flowers, so humans can't change their talents. It's the same sort of message that keeps coming out. This is gonna sound quite a repetitive video. So it emphasizes how pointless envy is but bringing into that is obviously this idea of the conflict that we have because we always envy other people's I'm going to just highlight a couple of punctuation choices here so I'm running out of space but we've got this colon to make this stand out a little bit more I'm going to highlight that because this is a choice here and it comes back into the poem at the end and we'll have a look at that again the colon emphasizes consequences that's a really good um, point to make because it's a structural point and I think that students who tend to just talk about words and word choice although that's perfectly adequate um, aren't going to reach up to those higher marks because they're not thinking about these structural choices. They're difficult to talk about. And the idea that it's end stopped as well, which the point that we've already made, contains the argument up here. She's going to move on. And should it fret, you would suppose it ne'er had seen its own red rose, nor after gentle shower had ever smelled its rose's scent, or it could ne'er be discontent with its own pretty flower. Now as I'm reading it through again, I'm realizing that there's a rhyme here. Suppose rose, scent, discontent, shower, flower. And it's a strange rhyme. I'm gonna make a point about rhyme here. Because if it was just rhyming couplets, perhaps it would be a bit too, um, just we could dismiss it quite easily as being a bit a bit too simple this poem um, so 
perhaps she's made the decision not to use rhyming couplets avoids simplest simplistic meaning and we get this like reflective final four lines per stanza the rhymes rhyme structure is completely consistent throughout with a slight twist at the end but we'll come on to that in, in a second um so the rhyming structure it sort of forces you in these final forces you in the final line to reflect now this is interesting because isn't that um, just what she's saying to you as a reader you have to reflect on your own gifts and talents and avoid looking too closely at whoever is next to you whoever your friends are or what their talents are and I like that this rhyme scheme forces you to reflect back to that third line rather than to get the answer too easily see that when a rhyme scheme is, is a bit complex like that it forces you to have a have a little bit of a rethink about why it's why it's like that and your guess is as good as mine you know we can't ask her why she chose to do the the rhyme scheme in this way but i think the rhyme scheme is, is slightly slightly more complex than the, just a consistent rhyming couplets because it, it forces you to reflect on what has been said and um, helps to reinforce the idea of reflection on your own talents what else can we say here? This, uh, these words have been clipped. That's what they're called, clipped, clipped words. Can you see? There's a little uh, apostrophe there. There's an one again there, and this is basically just so that it flows as part of a, a poem. The lines flow together. She's trying to keep to a very consistent rhythm and never creates two syllables, whereas the word ne'er creates one. And so she's clipped these words to reinforce the rhyme. And we know that's important because, um, sorry, the rhyme and the rhythm, because she wrote nursery rhymes and fairy tales so she's probably used to these poems being uh, maybe sung maybe repeated maybe being recited and they're certainly easier to remember if there are certain um if there are a certain rhythm to them moving on to this uh, like such a blind and senseless tree as i've imagined this to be all envious persons are, with care and culture, all may find some pretty flower in their own mind, some talent that is rare. Thinking still about rhyme, isn't it interesting how this doesn't really rhyme with this? The word rare and the word are, it's, I mean, we, we, it's, it's hard to say how they would have said this back in, you know, the, the 18th century, but we, we can say that it's a half rhyme and it's a completely acceptable point to make it is a half rhyme and perhaps this is emphasizing people's unique natures that you know we don't all have to fall into line uh, this this poem does a really good job of being consistent being predictable the rhyme scheme just repeating over and over in every stanza but the final little twist in that is that there is a half rhyme at the end uh, i'm going to put this as a structural point because i think that she deliberately places that word there um, and it really is in, um, reinforced because the word rare obviously means like you know not un unrepeated almost you know, unpredictable, rare is something that doesn't come up very often. So this is a good, I think this is quite a strong point because not only is it emphasised in the rhyme, it's also emphasised in the word rare as well. I think one more thing to say about this, and we'll go through some of these, um, one, thing, one more thing to say about this stanza is the use of the hendiadus here, blind and senseless, care and culture. And I think there's a real sense here that this hendiadus Hendiadus is when you have just two um, adjectives like you've got there with a connecting and in the middle. So rather than such a blind, senseless tree, blind and senseless. And I know that's done for rhythm too, but it's also effective because they sort of echo 
and contrast each other. It seems that she's used them both here, blind and senseless, as being the negative. But care and culture being the positive. It's almost like there are two options as she's winding up, as she's getting to the end of the poem where you're going to stop reading. You've got to take away something from this poem. And all poets want you to take away their message, why they started writing this poem. And this seems to be the two binary opposites that she's giving you to choose from here. Put that down. So it's a binary opposite to the first um, Hendiadis that's happening up here in line one. So that's all I was going to say in terms of the language and structure choices that this poet uses. I'm going to make one more point as well about um, I'm going to make one more point again as, as about narrative structure. So this rose tree is not made to bear. We're back up in line one up here. And the narrative structure that she's using up here is the third person narrative. In stanza one, she uses this third person narrative to talk about a specific person, or it could just be anybody, but it's all in third person. When we move on to stanza two, she's talking to you, as a reader. And then we're in second person narrative. Okay. So she sets out the argument using a generalised third person tone. She personalises the argument by using a second person narrative. And finally at the end she manages to have some kind of advice or reflection by using this third, uh, first, sorry, first person narrative. This progression from third, second to first, I think is really intentional. It's part of the argument that she's creating, the logical setting out of this argument about envy. We come back down to the, uh, the bottom here, about the tone, we're going to try and just think of the techniques that we've looked at already to uh, think about how these things are um, exemplified in this poem. So these are all the techniques that we've already looked at, but it's nice to have them in your tone bank at the bottom here. Okay, so she's got this didactic tone, and I think the colons really serve to signify the consequences. You could say the hendiadis as well. Colons emphasise that there are consequences to acting in a certain way and that reinforces the didactic tone. There's an instructional tone and I think the narrative structure helps with this. General, specific and then advice instructing us the third, second, first person narratives. And there is a logical tone as well, because all the stanzas are end stopped. You could also add into their rhyme. The rhyme adds to this logical structure. It's consistent, it's predictable. But I was gonna just say very simply that all the stanzas are end stops and contain uh, a progression of developed arguments. So she doesn't start off by saying, I don't, I, you know, I think that you shouldn't be envious of people. I think that you should just be grateful for your own talents. She doesn't start off with that. She progresses and develops to the point where she can give you advice because she's built up the arguments. So on the surface, a very, very simple poem on the surface, a very simple poem. But as you have a look at all of the annotations that we've done over the past, what, if, what has this been, 24 minutes, I think you can see that there's quite a lot more going on with this poem than, um, than you would have thought to begin with. Well, thank you for listening. If you need to watch any of it again, head uh, just rewind and head back through um, and stay tuned for the next poem.